Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, another Friday. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'khiru wa na'uzu billah min shiruri anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahariyala. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallahu wa ahdahu la shirika la. Anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhalazina amanatukullaha. Hakka tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhalnaas attaku rabukum alazi khalakakum min nafsin wahida. Wa khalaka minha zawjaha. Wa basa minhuma. Rijalun kathiran wa nisa'a. Wa takullahi alazi tussa'aluna bihi wal arham. Inna allaha kana alaykum makiba. Ya ayyuhalazina amanatukullaha wa kulu kawlan sadida. Yuslih lakum amalakum. Wa yaghfir lakum zanubakum. May yati allaha wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azimah. Amabad. My dear brothers and sisters, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that there is no, that the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last messenger and his last prophet. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I am so grateful that I have an opportunity once again to reflect with you on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today I'd like to share with you some reflections on the name of Allah, which is Zul Jalali Wal Ikram. Zuljan Ali Walikra means the Lord of Majesty and Generosity. And we can break these, we can break this name down into two root words. So we have Zuljan Ali and we have Wal Ikram. So the first part of it, Zuljan Ali or Jim Lam Lam or Jalal, uh, means to be glorious, to be majestic, far above anything. And Kaf Ra Meem or Karam means to be generous to be honored, to be precious. And the beginning of it, Dhu, Dhu or Dhul means the possessor of. So Zul Jalali wal Akram is the possessor of great majesty and generosity. Among the scholars, generally speaking, they say that Zul Jalali wal Akram means the Lord of majesty and generosity. So it's important for us to recognize that this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a pair. Zul Jalali and wal Akram. And Zul Jalali talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's self. So Zul Jalali for us signifies uh, Allah's majesty, Allah's power, which is awe-inspiring. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from all blemishes. So if we think about in terms of our society, we tend to be amazed by many things. And we're especially in awe of things and skill that, that is greater than or better than anything we can do ourselves or imagine ourselves. So um, think of the athletes. Think of them amazing. Uh, think of the amazing feats that they accomplish in the course of of their sport. Or the celebrities. We look at them. We seem to follow them and we praise them. And individuals, you know, who have done amazing things, for example, in their industries, we tend to be just in awe of them as individual. And more recently, for example, with artificial intelligence. So if I think of amazing as the range, we're on the low end of this range is some piece of content that showcases a skill or an artistic accomplishment. And on the high end of this range is a person who has achieved what few people could achieve. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond any of this range, beyond anything we can conceive or come up with. So the majesty and greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our wildest imagination. So in this sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolute control over everything we can see and everything we cannot see. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent. And it is the limits of our human nature that stop us from realizing the complete magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So wal ikram is about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with his creation. So his generosity towards his creation and the honor and kindness that he shows his creation. Wal ikram emphasizes Allah's compassionate nature for everything that he has created, not just in this world, but also in the hereafter. So Zul Jalali emphasizes his magnificence and Wal Ikram emphasizes his compassion for his creations. So some scholars even debate that, you know, Zul Jalali Wal Ikram, can we actually consider that a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the reason for this debate is that the prefix or the antecedent, Zul, the possessor of, when preceding a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a sentence that describes Allah, Dhu is not indicative of a name typically. So for example, in the Quran, 
we'll find that Allah is also described as Dhul Maghfira, the possessor of forgiveness. But that is not one of the names or attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least that is not what the scholars agree on. So, however, Dhul Maghfira, uh, you know, is mentioned in the Quran. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram is a name that the scholars do agree um, on. Now, anytime scholars agree, there has to be some kind of evidence. So what is this evidence that the scholars uh, found that, you know, causes them to agree that Zul Jalali wal Ikram is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find uh, an authentic hadith uh, recorded by a tirmidhi that reports that the Prophet said, you know, call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Azwabi Zul Jalali wal Ikram. Recite frequently Ya Zul Jalali wal Ikram. And what Ya Zul Jalali wal Ikram means, oh, you possessor of glory and honor. And because the Prophet Sallallahu uses this as a name of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, by asking us, call upon Zul Jalali wal Ikram. So that calling upon uh, indicates that this is a name that, that we can take away as one of the attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So the opinions of the scholar is that this is one of the names. So in another authentic hadith, we find that uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, may Allah be pleased with her. Um, and she reported as saying that when Allah's messenger, meaning Prophet sallallahu wanted to turn from his salah, he would seek forgiveness from Allah three times and then say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam, tabarakta ya azul jalali wa al-ikram. Oh Allah, you are a salam. And salam means peace. And from you is all peace. Blessed are you, O possessor of majesty and honor. And in this hadith, Aisha Ta'ala is sharing with us that Prophet Wasallam would say this after his salah. So he would say, Astaghfirullah, 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 three times, and then he would recite, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam, tabarak ya zul jalali wa ikram. So if we did this uh, after every salah for ourselves, then we would be following the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Wasallam. Uh, and in the Quran, uh, we find Zul Jalali wal Ikram, they appear together and they appear only twice. And both times this name appears in Surah Ar Rahman. Uh, and to me, this is fascinating because if I think about Surah Al Fatiha, the third verse in the opening chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two of his names. And the first name in that verse is Ar Rahman, the Beneficent, followed by Ar Rahim, the Merciful. And if we find Zul Jalali wal Ikram mentioned twice in the Quran, we find it in a chapter named Ar Rahman. That to me was just a beautiful um, uh, thing to reflect on. So, what's even more interesting to me is that Surah Ar Rahman addresses humankind and jinn kind in one chapter. And these are the two creations who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given free will. And it becomes even more interesting as the structure of the chapter. Um, you know, is studied the separation of the verses. So, you know, um, the first half, if I can break it up into halves, the first half before the first, the, before the first time we see Zul Jalali Wal Ikram appear, Allah is talking about the worldly life. And then right after that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about the, the hereafter, talking about heaven and, and what we can expect and experience over there. So it's beautiful how the arrangement of the verses take place inside of Surah Ar-Rahman. And verse 27 is where we find uh, Zul Jalali wal Ikram appear first. So before verse 27, Allah is talking about um, topics like the creation of humanity, the teaching of speech to humanity so that we can communicate, the creation of and traveling of the sun and the moon on their prescribed paths, uh, and the creation of the sky to shelter us on earth and more. In this chapter, Allah talks about the two east and the two west, and we know this uh, through science and the study of astrology, that the sun and the moon are traveling within the range between east and west. Um, and then Allah talks about the plants, Allah talks about herbs and fires, and talks about skills like pottery, and many things that Allah mentions about creating repeatedly throughout this chapter. Uh, you know, and Allah is telling us uh, in this chapter, when, then which of your Lord's favors will you both deny? So let's talking about the creation, talking about what Allah has given us as favors. And then in this chapter, Allah talks to us or mentions 31 times. So there are 78 verses 
in these chapters, of which 31 of them Allah is saying, then which of your Lord's favor will you both deny? And both in this case, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the jinn as well as um, mankind. And notice, notice how this question is phrased. There's no mention of how many blessings. There's no counter in there. But Allah asks us, which of these blessings would we deny? So there's an indication here that there are so many favors upon us that, that it's too difficult to enumerate. It would be impossible, in fact, for us to enumerate every single blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or every single favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us. And then Allah is asking, which of these countless blessings are you going to deny or are you willing to deny? So the logical implication here is that if you deny even one of these favors from Allah, then you are being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's an uh, authentic hadith recorded in At-Tirmidhi again, that the messenger of Allah came to his companions and recited Surah Ar-Rahman from its beginning uh, to the end. And throughout the recitation, the companions were silent. So he said, I recited it to the jinns on the night of the jinns. And they had a better response to it than you did. Each time I came to Allah saying, which of your Lord's favor do you deny? The jinn said, we do not deny any of your favors, our Lord, and yours is praise. So with this hadith, we learn two things. We learned that there were jinn who became Muslim because of the Prophet ﷺ, because of his recitation. So when he's reciting Surah Rahman to a group of jinns, they wouldn't be listening if they weren't Muslims. And second thing we learned from this hadith is that um, the recitation of Surah Rahman took place on a night that was subsequently called Laylatul Jinn or the night of the jinns. Now this is this hadith is one of the few places from the seat of the Prophet ﷺ where we learn about uh, this night, the night of the jinns or Laylatul Jinn. Um, you know, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but I just find this story absolutely amazing that, you know, the night when the Prophet ﷺ left his companions for a bio break and did not return all night until the next day, you know, he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, when he came back, told the companions this story that he was with the jinn, uh, teaching them their deen, teaching them about uh, being a Muslim. So the companions at this point, you know, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't return, were worried that something awful may have happened to him. Some of them thought that, you know, he may have been even assassinated because this event took place uh, at a time right after one of the most difficult trials for the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he visited Taif. So if you recall the story of Taif, it was when the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca uh, to invite the people of Taif to Islam. And Taif um, is a city in an area about um, 50 miles southeast of Mecca. And this was in about the 10th year of his prophethood. So this was a time when, when um, his wife Aish, um, Khadija عنها, had just passed away recently. His uncle had also passed away. And in this time of difficulty, Prophet ﷺ goes with uh, one of his companions, Zayd ibn Hadith, and they travel to Taif together to invite the people of um, Thaqif, which are the name of the tribes there, to invite them towards Islam. And during his stay there, the, re the you know, invites the leaders, invites the tribe, they all reject um, his call to Islam. And as the Prophet ﷺ was completing his stay and was leaving, the leaders of the tribe ordered a mob of young people to stone him and his companion as they were leaving uh, Tahif back to Mecca. So the mob in this case was successful. Our Prophet ﷺ and his companion Zayd were bleeding so much from this attack that they were, they were dizzy with all the loss of blood and blood was rolling down to their feet and it was stuck to their shoes. So on the way back to Makkah, Prophet ﷺ spent the night in an area where there were, there were trees. And we know from the tafsir of Surah Al-Aqaf that this area was called uh, Nakhla. So when Prophet ﷺ woke up from the Hajj that night, he recited the Qur'an out loud. And in that moment, little did he know that there were jinns listening to him. They stopped and listened to him recite the Qur'an. And afterwards, these jinn became Muslim. So we learn about this in Surah al uh, Surah al verses uh, 29 to 30, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, remember, O Prophet, when we sent a group of jinn your way to listen to the Quran. Then upon hearing it, they said to one another, listen quietly. Then when it was over, they returned to their fellow jinn as warners. They declared, O our fellow jinn, we have truly heard a scripture revealed after Moses 
confirming what came before it. It guides to the truth and the straight way. The verse right after this one, the jinn exclaim, O oh, our fellow jinn, respond to the caller of Allah. So they're talking about the Prophet ﷺ. Respond to the caller of Allah and believe in him. He will forgive your sins. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will forgive your sins and protect you from a painful punishment. So these verses in Surah Al-Hakaf indicate for us that the jinn were calling to one another to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And this is the foundation of being a Muslim. What is the first thing we do is we say the shahada to declare ourselves Muslim. Right? So the jinn are doing exactly the same thing. So coming back to the night when the Prophet ﷺ left his companions and then returned the next day after Laylatul Jinn, he told his companion that he was called by a group of jinns over the mountain who had embraced Islam. And um, he, he then took this journey so that he could teach them their religion. And he said this to his companions that it took him all night to teach the jinn uh, about Islam. Now, we have to remember something here. There are, there are no witnesses among the companions. We have limited uh, information except for a few authentic hadith and the Quran validating that this night actually took place. There was this event where the Prophet ﷺ had spent a night with the jinn. You know, now, imagine this for a moment. The Prophet ﷺ being invited by jinn and then leaving this realm, our realm, to enter the realm of the jinn. Okay, so there's no witnesses. Nobody saw the Prophet ﷺ go into this realm and then leave this realm afterwards to come back to our realm. And it's amazing to me that Prophet ﷺ was willing to do that. So the scholars indicate that um, because of the timing of all of this, this is a symbolic event. So Ta'if happens first, one of the most difficult trials of the Prophet ﷺ. And he's not able to get them to... Um, to join him or become Muslim. So he's left not only unsuccessful, he's also left hurt, bleeding from the attack that they, they conducted. And the symbolism of jinn accepting Islam is that Allah is telling the Prophet Sallallahu that even if one group of people refuse to accept Islam, there's another group who heard his call and accepted even if they were not from among mankind. And there's another important symbolism here uh, that we can take away uh, about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that he's being told that he is a messenger for both humankind and jinn kind because jinn only had warners. And we, we know this from Surah Al-Aqaf as well. Um, and the messengers were always human. So in Surah Yusuf, uh, for example, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala very clearly tells us, and also in Surah Al-Furqan, so in Surah Yusuf, Allah says that we only sent before you a prophet men inspired by us from among the people of each society. And in Surah Al-Furqan, Allah tells us, we never sent any messenger before you, O Prophet, who did not eat food and go about in marketplaces. So from the evidence in the Quran, we learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only sent messengers who were human, and that the messengers were sent for both jinn and mankind, because the jinn were aware of the prophets and the message that they brought with them, but the jinn could only warn other jinns to follow and ask them to follow. So coming back to Surah Ar-Rahman and uh, the name we're talking about, Zul Jalali Wal Ikram, when we arrive on verse 26 of Surah Ar-Rahman, the verse right before where Allah mentions his name, Zul Jalali Wal Ikram, for the first time, Allah tells us in verse 26, Kullu man alayha fani. Every being on earth is bound to perish. So Allah is letting us know that while He subhanahu wa ta'ala created all these wonderful creations, there will be a day when all of it will come to an end, except only your Lord Himself, full of majesty and honor, will remain forever. So Allah is telling us that as dwellers of this earth, we are subject to decay and death. While the indication is about life on this earth, it does not exclude any celestial creations or heaven or the rest of the universe. Only by the will of Allah does creation continue to exist. And when creation will cease to exist, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remain. And this is a sign of Allah's boundless power over the universe. So from verse 28 onwards in Surah Rahman, 
Allah talks about the life in the hereafter. So this transition is beautiful in this chapter where Allah goes from talking about this worldly life, then talking about the heavens, the hereafter, and the day of judgment. And in the last verse of Surah Rahman, so this is verse number 78 in Surah Rahman, Allah says, Tabarak asmu rabbika zil jalali wal ikram. Blessed is the name of your Lord, full of majesty and honor. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran. And such a beautiful chapter to recite and, and read. And I hope you'll take the time to reflect. May Allah guide us. May Allah give us the guidance. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us the wisdom that gives us the ability to then apply this knowledge in our own personal lives. My dear brothers and sisters, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask for his forgiveness and he is the forgiver, the merciful. I hope you find benefit from this beautiful name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With each name we learn, we must always find ways to incorporate the learning into our lives. Otherwise, um, it's just additional knowledge that we're not really benefiting from. So how can we do this with Zul Jalali Bulikram? How do we apply this into our own personal lives? So the way I look at it is if we follow the sunnah for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after we say our salah, we say astaghfirullah three times and right after that, before we make our dua, we say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ta yazul jalali wa alaykum. This would be one way in which we can apply this beautiful name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our life. So remember, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ta yazul jalali wa alaykum. Oh Allah, you are a salam, which is peace. And from you is all peace. Blessed are you, O possessor of majesty and honor. So when we follow the sunnah of our Prophet Wasallam, we are in fact glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we recite any of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are in fact glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is another way that we can glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aside from, from these obvious ways in which we, we many of us may already be aware about? Um, there's another authentic hadith that tells us that we can glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing three things. Give honor and respect to our elders. You know, we live in a society where more of our values are coming from concerns of individualism instead of the concern from the collective. And this is something that um, has many risks for us as, as uh, communities. So giving respect to our elders is a way to honor that continuation from one generation to another. The second way in this hadith we are told, is to give honor to those who have memorized the Qur'an, those who have put in the time and effort to commit to memory and recite for the rest of their lives the message of the Qur'an over and over again. So Allah tells us to honor those who have memorized the Qur'an. And the, and the third way in which, in which the Prophet ﷺ tells us is to give honor to rulers who promote justice. And we see this quality just lacking in, in today's day and age, and more so with every generation, it seems. So when we do see a leader, when we do see somebody who does promote justice, even potentially at a, a cost of personal harm, we should honor them. Because that is what our Prophet Sallallahu advises us to do, is to honor our elders, honor those who memorize the Quran, and then honor those rulers who promote justice. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our good deeds, all of our actions, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in good intentions so that our actions may reflect those act those intentions and guide our hearts towards Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amen. Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat, wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat, wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitat, wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqat, wal-Sabirina wal-Sabirat, wal-Khashi'ina wal-Khashi'at, wal-Mutasaddiqina wal-Mutasaddiqat, wal-Sa'imina wal-Sa'imat, wal-Hafizina wal-Rujahum wal-Hafizat, وَذَاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَذَاكِرَاتٍ أَدَّ اللَّهَ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا رَبَّنَا حَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنٍ وَأَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا رَبَّنَا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا وَكَفِّرْ عَنَّا سَيِّئَاتِنَا وَتَوَفَّنَا مَعَ الْأَبْرَارِ رَبَّنَا لَا تَزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَّابُ رَبَّنَا عَلَيْكَ تَوَكَّلْنَا وَإِلَيْكَ نَبْنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرُ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَّمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَىٰ وَيَنْهَىٰ عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنكَرِ وَالْبَغْيِ يَعِظُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ لِّلْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ آمِينَ اللَّهُمَّ آمِينَ